and welcome everyone to today's Association for Manufacturing Excellence webinar titled, The Common Sense of People-Centric Leadership. I'm Jerry Strohmeyer, the Education Training Program Coordinator for AME, and I will be your moderator. Today's presenter is Alan Coletta, Senior Director of Engineering and Facilities for Siemens Health and Ears Reagent Manufacturing Facility in Delaware. He previously served as a site manager for ICI's largest specialty chemicals plant in North America, where he introduced and developed numerous lean systems and unionized chemical process operations. Alan authored The Lean 3P Advantage, a practitioner's guide to the production preparation process, which won the 2013 Shingle Prize for Research and Professional Publication. Alan serves on the Delaware MEP Fiduciary and Advisory Boards, is a member of the AME Champions, serves on AME's People-Centric Leadership KRA team, and is a former member of the Delaware Chamber of Commerce Board of Manufacturing Managers. He is a chemical engineer with significant experience in manufacturing, technical, and supply chain organizations. Before we start, just a couple housekeeping items. You will be in listen-only mode throughout the webinar. You will see that you are muted on your attendee panel on the right side of your screen. If you have questions during the webinar, Please type them into your questionnaire in the attendee panel and click on Submit. We'll review the questions at the end of today's presentation and answer as many as we can. When you log off today, please check your email inbox, and it will be a survey, a short attendee webinar survey. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey today as your feedback is very important to us to improve future webinars. Ellen has also graciously agreed to provide a PDF of today's presentation. We will be sending that along with a recorded link for a webinar replay to each of you next week. Now I'm pleased to introduce Alan Coletto, who will present the common sense of people-centric leadership. Take it away, Alan. Well, thank you, Jerry, and welcome to uh, all of you who have made time in your day to uh, to spend time with us. Uh, I hope it's a, a worthwhile investment of time, and uh, this is a subject that is uh, really near and dear to my heart. Uh, as Jerry mentioned, I've, I've been involved in different types of managerial roles for uh, quite a long time in my career. And I've, I've got to say that I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I've probably practiced the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, many times over the years as well. So this is a subject that I think there's a, a certain urgency to it uh, in the sense that the world that we live in has been really radically changing over the years, and we're going to take some time today to explore that and uh, hopefully by the time we're done, give you some thoughts and in, in ways of progressing your own journey towards people-centric leadership. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what is people-centric leadership, and uh, there's a number of known uh, names that are being tossed around relative to the subject. Uh, people-centric leadership seems to be the more common one, but uh, the idea of truly human leadership is something that uh, Bob Chapman I know embraces, and a lot of folks like Simon Sinek sort of rally to that. And I've also heard the term servant leadership being uh, thrown about. When it's all boiled down, it really comes down to uh, a different focus on leadership that really puts people at the center of it. And uh, that's a little different than what we've seen in the past, and we're going to spend some time looking at that. Um, this concept of leadership is nothing new. There's been a lot of focus on leadership over the years, and particularly in the last four or five years. Uh, I love uh, the quote by Bob Chapman that, that Generally, people don't like to be bossed, supervised, managed, or directed. People desire to be led. And that's becoming more and more important in our workforce. So what exactly is people-centric leadership? So obviously, business is about driving results and positive outcomes. Um, you know, we're, we're in business to help our corporations, our businesses, you know, get results, make money, satisfy customers. Uh, all of these things are part of the day-to-day -day operation of any kind of business. Even nonprofits, frankly, have the same types of types of deliverables. And so this drive for results is something that's always in front of us. So what we try to distinguish in people-centric leadership is that, yeah, there's a place for managing processes. You know, we're not going to abandon going after metrics, going after outcomes and deliverables and getting projects done on time. But we, what we are going to understand is that there's a difference between managing and continually improving our processes compared to leading the people who actually operate in those systems and processes. And that's a pretty important distinction. 
uh, we often uh, see managers get confused and we try to manage people. And generally that doesn't have great results because people in the nature of human beings requires a different approach. And ideally where we're going with this is to get to a culture of people that are really self-directed, that they want to self-direct to engage in the activities that you're providing for them to do, rally behind your mission, your vision, and your purpose so that they become employees who are not just there to punch a ticket and collect a paycheck, but they're people who are actively working arm in arm with you to try to drive your organization and make it successful. And that requires a different style of management than what we've typically practiced over the past probably 40 or 50 years. So when, when I think about this, I always ask the question, so what's changed? What's the big deal? And is there really a problem? And I think if we look back, and uh, we'll have a few slides here to talk through this, you know, the nature of work has really changed dramatically from being a much slower pace and much more, I think, focused to nowadays it seems like everybody has to multitask. We have to be much more agile. We have to do things differently. The nature of the world has changed. It's a much smaller world than the one we were born into. And the fact that the world is now a place where we can get our materials from anywhere, we can sell our products anywhere, we have competition coming from everywhere, that dynamic is playing out in how we have to conduct business today. And it's, it's fundamentally different than what was done 20 or 30 years ago, even 10 years ago. And then lastly, the workforce has changed. And uh, we're seeing you know, a, dr a dramatic change in the workplace where we have people who are actually still part of the centennial generation. We've got baby boomers. We've got Gen Y, Gen X. We've got you know, the whole influx and changes brought on by the millennial generation, which is really taking over the majority of the workplace. And these dynamics are forcing us to think about how we lead people. I put up this slide um, because when I started working uh, in manufacturing plants, uh, this was pretty much the norm. Uh, we'd have people out there, and even engineers, operators, and this this idea that you know the work is skilled, but it's repetitive. You know, the expectation was that people would follow the rules. They'd punch in, they'd punch out, they'd get breaks in the morning, a break in the afternoon, half hour for lunch. But they were really treated, and the expectation was that, hey, they're a pair of hands just there to get a job done. So what's changed? Well, I sort of alluded to this, that the world is smaller, right? This, this concept of, of globalization, and we're all experiencing that. Um, it, it creates wonderful opportunities to get our products out of our factories, uh, in, in locate them not just in North America or in Europe, but really all regions of the world. And uh, we're, we're much more cognizant of that. Um, many of us are either uh, selling to or getting our, our raw materials and selling our products into Asia. And so that's a huge dynamic and a growing, growing marketplace that is uh, you know, creating a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of competition for us. Um, concept of outsourcing is uh, is again nothing nothing new we've been doing outsourcing for 20 years in fact there's more interest now I think in insourcing than there ever has been but the fact is is that most of the simple repetitive work that was being done in our plants and in our offices has uh, been either eliminated or in many cases it's been been shipped offshore so again big change in dynamics uh, the nature of business, you know, is much, much more complex. The complexity of business due to the speed of things happening, due to the way that uh, customers' expectations have changed, uh, just the interest in managing the entire supply chain, all of these things have created a huge dynamic shift uh, that we have to deal with. And then, obviously, the speed of business has radically changed. The, uh, the fact is that you know the expectations of customers, because there's so much more competition, and with the advent of companies like Amazon and two-day service and crazy things out there that we couldn't even imagine before, the uh, the speed of business has just gotten to the point where 
if you're not agile, if you're not flexible, if you're not able to basically carve out the inefficiencies in your business, somebody else will find a way to do it and, and take your business. So huge pressures. And the last point I'll make here, uh, and there's probably a hundred more very similar type thoughts. The, the millennial generation in the workplace, uh, in the shift from the boomers and the approach that the boomers had to work versus the way the millennials are looking at the workplace, this generation is very, very connected. You know, they walk around, we've got smart, everybody has smartphones. They've got communication going on through text messages, through different social media on a nonstop basis. The way we communicate has changed. Millennials tend to desire purpose in their work. They desire to be challenged. And, and fundamentally, they're not anchored to a company. I think that latter point is probably one of the most significant ones because previously, the thought that you would go to work for a company and work there until you collected a pension at the end of your days, that whole schema has changed. And we've seen it change in the last 15, 20 years where unless you're working for the government perhaps or very few industries, uh, there are no pensions anymore. People are given 401k programs, companies are contributing to that, but you're pretty much on your own. Those, those investment devices have become very portable, so that makes it very easy for people to leave one company, move to another company, and just carry on. So all of these things are playing in to make it very challenging to keep high-quality people working in our, in our places of business. What's the big deal? What's the impact of this? Um, Gallup has really stirred the pot. If you look at the work that they've done, which is extremely significant, they've gone out with a pretty simple survey. You, their Q12 survey has been used all over the world. And uh, very typically, you hear people say, well, yeah, 30% of the, of the workforce is engaged, and 70% is disengaged, and 13% is actively disengaged. And those terminologies sort of roll off the tongue. But if you actually look at it on a global basis, and this goes back to their 2011-12, uh, that's the most recent one I could find, this particular survey compares all the different regions of the world. And if you look through that, 29% uh, engagement is the highest uh, on this list, and uh, actively disengaged are ranging from, you know, I think 16 to, to up to 29, 33%. I mean, actively disengaged is is pretty pretty significant. But the fact that we've got, you know, literally a third of our workforce engaged and two thirds or better not engaged in the work that they're doing makes you just wonder if you could. If you're successful now, if you can move the needle in a positive direction to get more people engaged and working with you to drive your business, you know what could you possibly do? So just to clarify a little bit, they Gal breaks out the three different types of employees. Uh, engaged is what everybody hopes we have. Uh, engaged employees work with passion. They feel a profound connection to their company. They drive innovation. They move the organization forward. The not engaged group, which is the majority, these are folks who basically they they come they they come to work every day they're good solid citizens they they collect a paycheck, but they're not driving your business they're basically doing what you tell them to do and probably doing it in many cases very effectively, but they're not taking you any place they're basically punching the ticket and they're they're doing work but their their hearts and their heads are probably somewhere else. And then the last group is just actively disengaged. And uh, I've heard one person express it as they're, they're in your workplace and they're basically sabotaging you. All the things that the engaged folks are trying to drive forward, these are the anchors that are basically holding you back. So these are, that's the terminology. The, the Gallup folks have done a great job looking at many, many companies and many industries. And what they've done on this slide is essentially look at the top quadrant you know, so this is only the top 25%. These aren't necessarily the best in the world for people-centric leadership, but this is the better group according to their survey for engagement. And they compare that to the bottom quartile. So we're looking at top versus bottom quartile. And you can see comparing those two groups, you've got 37% who report less absenteeism, and less employee turnover. 
48% fewer safety incidents, 41% fewer product defects, 21% higher productivity, 22% higher profitability. I mean, if you can think about your business and wherever you fall on that spectrum, if you can move the needle and get more people engaged in working with you, think about the possibilities for what that's going to do to your bottom line. Now, I would suggest that that shouldn't be your motivation, but I, I do re realize that a lot of people uh, are, particularly in the executive ranks, sort of struggle with what's the ROI on this. If I if I go back to the the idea of investing in your company culture, investing in your people so that they uh, you develop them, you become a learning organization. Is that really worth the climb? And I think charts like this very clearly point out that even if you have no heart, if you're a heart of stone, and you have no care for your people, there's a lot of really practical reasons why you want to move to a more engaged culture. So let's talk about leadership. Engagement is a byproduct of leadership. I think we all know people who would probably self-direct and, you know, there's a small portion of the population that no matter what you throw at them, they're going to plug in and they're going to do the best they can. They're going to try to drive the ball forward for you. But there's the vast majority of people who are really in a certain environment. And if you don't change that environment to make it more conducive for them to self-direct and willingly give more of themselves, probability is really low that they're ever going to do that. And so it's been pretty well proven that leaders generally establish the workplace environment. In other words, the things that we, we focus on, the behaviors that we demonstrate are being emulated. And so the leader of an organization at the very senior level sets policy decisions and things like that. But, but the leaders at every phase of the process are basically having an influence over the people that they work with. Immediate managers, they claim, have the, the very most significant, greatest influence over their employees. And, and if you think about it, the, the person that you report to establishes how your problems get solved, how mistakes are being handled. Do, do you get criticized if you make a mistake, or do you look at it as a learning opportunity? These are things which every person who's employed by another person has to deal with every day. And so if you've got sort of an enlightened manager who is responding well and encouraging people and recognizing the good things that they're doing as well as coaching when things don't go well, great managers lead to engaged employees. And if you think about it, uh, that just really makes sense, right? If you are a parent and you have you know, children, uh, if you're always criticism, criticizing them, you're going to sort of get to a certain level where they'll, where they'll comply to your requirements, but they certainly won't flourish. And so most parents recognize that if you, you know, praise kids when they do a great job and when you coach them when they can do things better, you know, do the corrections, help them be accountable, you know, the things that work to have a healthy family also help to have a healthy work family. At the executive level, the uh, the leadership there, of course, establishes company policy. Typically, they're the ones that are establishing what the company values are. Uh, they're determining the performance systems. They're setting up in the recognition systems. So the executive leadership has, because of their span of control, uh, has a huge a huge impact on what the uh, what the organization is going to do. But I will tell you, and we'll talk a lot in uh, in, a, in upcoming moments that that really, no matter where you are on the spectrum, if you work for a company that's totally embracing people-centric leadership, um, I think there's an advantage to that. But if you're just an isolated person who just believes this is the right way to lead and to run an organization, um, if you're the frontline supervisor, if you're a middle manager or a director, no matter where you are on the spectrum, there's a way that you can start employing this and I uh, can just about guarantee you're going to see the results to the extent that you apply it. So this is another quote by Bob Chapman that really speaks to the impact of this. Uh, and I love this quote. I've heard him say it numerous times. At the end of the average workday, seven out of eight people go home feeling unfulfilled, believing that the company they work for, 
doesn't care about them. And if you imagine what the impact is of this disengagement, this feeling like nobody really cares about you or what you did, the impact of that, not only in the workplace, but on your family, on, the, on your community, is very significant. It's, a, it's just a very, it's very hard if you've been treated poorly all day and you feel bad about yourself and bad about the world, it's very hard to turn that off when you leave the workplace and go, go out into your rest of your life. So it's very important for a whole lot of reasons. And the spillover is just tremendous. So there's this concept here that we'll explore a little bit, this idea of, of hands, you know, hands, heads, and hearts. Um, when you think about it, physical labor is, you know, we talk about labor, we talk about, um, you know, we refer to people in a way that, um, you know, we talk about head count, we talk about a pair of hands, we talk about labor, and that really expresses the physical work that people are doing, maybe skilled work, but it's still the physical work. And then we talk about engaging a person's head, their mind, and what does that mean? That's That's about getting people to, you know, have a say in making decisions and contributing ideas based upon their own observations and their experience working in the jobs they are. And then finally, this idea of heart, that employees, when you when you get to this level where people are engaging their skills with their hands, they're, they're using their minds to think about things and create ideas, and when they're passionate about what they're doing, that's the holy grail. That's where we all want to try to reach, where we've got people who are operating at all three levels and, and just willing to go that extra mile to uh, drive your business forward. And it's not just for that sort of business-oriented reason. When people are really working at that higher level, that level three activity, work becomes a lot more fun. The, the companies that I've visited that are, uh, you know, really – very people centric and very mature in their lean in their lean model you can you walk in there and there's a you can feel a palpable difference there's there's something in the air there's something in the environment that people are enjoying themselves they're working hard but they're they're having fun they're they're getting things done they're plugged into what the what the problems are and solving the problems and it's something that is very hard to express uh, either verbally or in a book or some other way. You almost have to experience it. And uh, it, there's some great opportunities like through the AME to you know, get some of those tours and visit some of those companies that perhaps we could talk about later if we have time. So level one is about hands, right? This is employees of labor, you know, where you're paid to do a job. And uh, from the perspective of motivation, Typically, the motivation we use with with uh, a labor situation is extrinsic. You know, it's carrot and stick type management. You know, you you have rules. You've got to follow the rules. You have breaks at a certain time. You you have time to eat lunch. You have time to go back to work. And and basically, you're monitoring the activity based upon piecework or time on task. Right. That's those are the kinds of metrics and, that we're looking at, and that's the kind of motivation that is typically practiced. So the question is, how does a supervisor manage at this level? Well, this is old school supervision, right? It's running by time clocks, it's defined breaks, it's skills training and procedures, it's monitoring outputs. And the common aspects of this culture would be, you know, we have locked tool cribs and storerooms, you know, the, the message being, we don't trust you not to steal from us. The idea of a supervisor's job is to really chase people out of the break rooms and make sure that they're at the at the job site working. Um, this is the kind of culture, frankly, which has led to unionization and these big rifts between management and labor. And I will have to just add a caveat to that, that that, that is not the case for many of the union relationships that we have in the country today and in the world today. Because of more enlightened management and greater leadership, uh, we're seeing many of those, those uh, what would have been very adversarial relationships melding to more partnerships. So uh, when I make a comment here about uh, unionism, it has nothing to do with unions. It has everything to do with leadership and the relationships that have been built or not built between different types of people, different types of jobs. Um, this is, you know, sort of a, 
I've, I've heard this stated more times than I'd like to admit that uh, you know, we pay to work, not to think. And that's sort of the hands level. In this next level, hands and uh, hands and heads, you know, we're work is more complex. You know, we've done a lot of downsizing over the years, and so in most of our operations, uh, people are working long hours. They're multitasking tremendous amounts of different types of activity, and uh, the ratios of supervision to the people actually doing the value added work has changed dramatically. So it's not uncommon to hear of you know one supervisor having 30 to 40 different direct reports. Um, you see that almost every day if you look for it. So the idea that you know a supervisor has all the answers and the people doing the work can just do the work and be told what to do is really not a practical approach to work anymore. We really need to become more collaborative, and from a management perspective, you really need to you know, bring people in. The motivation for this uh, is, from what I've seen, is still largely extrinsic. You know, the idea that if we run a lean event and we have, we do a 5S event, and everybody gets a t-shirt at the end of it or a ball cap. What we find is that as teams mature on their lean journey, that motivation tends to become much more intrinsic, where um, in, in the immature lean models where people would say do a Kaizen event every year or, or twice a year. So for twice a year, you pull them out of their work and they, they go out and they do something great and they get some affirmation and they get their t-shirt and, and you know you celebrate with a cake at the end of the week. You send them back to their day job and basically the light bulb goes back off and they go just putting along doing their normal day job until the next Kaizen event and they get all revved up and you bring them in and they engage then you send them back to your day job. When, when lean becomes more of a everybody, every day type of an approach, then what happens is you see that maturity model really develop. And, and as that happens, the motivation for people becomes almost exclusively intrinsic. So in this level, how does a supervisor manage? The idea is that you, you, know, you train employees not only in how to do their skills to to do their work, but part of their work now becomes you know making decisions and solving problems. So this is where the lean tools can dramatically help to engage people's heads. So this idea of helping them to uh, give them the ability to create job aids and to standardize and make work visible. Uh, Programs that encourage employee input help this a lot, right? And uh, assuming that they're effective and you actually work on their ideas. And then event-based improvement activities are great, but smaller, more frequent ones are probably more impactful for this, right? Then you look at sort of common aspects of this culture, right? The mature lean model, the idea of seeking employee improvements uh, on a very targeted basis, the idea that in the engagement is going to be better because you're involving people deliberately to make improvements in their area. For for many people, lean is this transformational step that has led them to level three, uh, where you've now engaged not only their hands and their, and their heads, but also their hearts. And uh, we've seen a number of companies, uh, you know, that and we'll mention a couple of them later. But a lot of companies have really gotten it right with their lean you know, lean maturity and, you know, the great companies like Toyota and uh, saw recently OC Tanner, companies like ShoreSeal. Uh, there's many, many companies that are out there, uh, many of whom are part of the AME organization, but they've really taken their lean to such this, this high level of maturity that they're really operating at the level three where, where people are fully engaging. And it's a, it's a great thing. This level three is where hands, heads, and hearts are all engaged in the work. You know, the work's complex. Uh, in most cases, it's largely self-directed. Top management sets sort of a strategic direction through Hoshin Conry uh, so that the three to five year plans are out there. People are dialed into it at basically all levels of the organization. 
the uh, functional areas are working together to make sure that there's adequate resourcing to support the strategic direction and to make sure that throughout their entire functional group, everybody knows what their part is to get work done and to uh, drive for those results. The, uh, the idea of stretch targets then are achieved through self-directed but highly engaged teams. And when you, when you see this operating, it's almost magical. It's, it's this kind of utopia where, you know, the, everybody knows where the direction we're going. Everybody's plugged into it. Everybody feels like they can contribute something to making it happen. And there's, there's also this realization that it's important. You know, there's customers that are going to benefit. There's lives that might be saved. There's intangible, in very tangible in some cases, benefits for the efforts that they're putting in. And this, of course, is where you know the motivation is you know, largely intrinsic, uh, recognition and celebration of positive behaviors. Uh, employees feel connected to corporate goals and desire to help achieve them. They believe that they are valued and they desire to contribute. So, from a, this perspective, how does a supervisor actually manage at this level? And in very typically, what we see is you know. The, the, the utilization of daily stand-up meetings. Um, and these are used to not only solve problems and track performance and, and targets, but they're also used to develop leadership, to recognize and celebrate the good things people have done. It's used to build accountability and help people with their problem-solving skills. It's about tracking key metrics and, and encouraging this everybody, every day improvement methodology. Great, great stuff. Coaching and teaching is a primary responsibility of all leaders. And treating failure in the problems that inevitably happen in any kind of a business is an opportunity to learn, grow, and get better. So common aspects of this particular culture, um, maturity in the lean approach. I, I put a lot of focus on this coupling of lean and people-centric leadership because I really believe that lean in and of itself can be a very, very powerful machine that drives your business forward. It becomes a way of thinking, a cultural change in, in the way your people approach business. But in some cases, we've, we've seen out there where, where people can be very adept at doing lean, but they don't necessarily have an equal and opposite focus on, I shouldn't say opposite, an equal focus on the people who are actually doing the processes. And what we've seen through, again, Toyota, Barry Waymiller, SureSeal, you know, the, the, the list goes on of really great companies that are getting this right, is they marry up this lean with a focus on people and development of leaders to be people-centric leaders. And when you can get that right, the whole, the whole, you know, the whole house goes up straight. So I think that's that's a differentiator where organizations like uh, the AME and Barry Way Miller, uh, who offer a, a lot of different courses, these these groups are doing things a little differently than a lot of the other outside consulting groups do relative to just improving engagement, uh, divorced from lean. All right, so let's uh, let's segue into what can we start doing. So how do we improve? And I think what you're going to find that the, the concepts of people-centric leadership are all pretty simple. There are things that you've inevitably been exposed to, you've probably thought about, you're probably practicing at some level. The challenge for us is that this isn't like go to a course, learn something new, and start doing it Monday. This is really learn about it, start Making a, make a decision to want to get better at it and then realize that, you know, this is a journey that probably has no end point, that your, your path and your organization's path to becoming skilled leaders is something that you are going to have to continually hone and get better and better and better at. Uh, so I don't think you ever end getting better. And uh, certainly we're all going to stumble at different times, but... Uh, it, the important thing is to decide you want to go down this path and then start moving towards it. So let's talk about, uh, this is a, a great article that just came out in Harvard Business Review this month, 
and uh, or last month. And uh, a very interesting statistic came out uh, from McKinsey's organization in March of 2016. It says that 70% of leaders rate themselves as inspiring and motivating, which is great. Until you you read the you know the rest of the story. And so while the leaders think that 70% of them think they're pretty darn good, 82% of employees see their leaders as fundamentally uninspiring. And this is the uh, this came from the Gallup organization also in 2016, so pretty relative recent data. So there's a massive disconnect between the way leaders perceive themselves and the way employees perceive them. And uh, to the point where, I, I love this quote, this was from Forbes, and uh, they did a study about the same time frame. And it said that 65% of employees would forgo a pay raise <laughs> if it meant seeing their leader fired. Now, we're not going to be able to do a show of hands on this call to see how many of you might be in that boat. But uh, if any of my folks are listening, hopefully that won't, you won't be raising your hand. Long story short is that we have a huge disconnect between the leader's perception of themselves and the employee's perception of leaders. And we somehow have to close that gap. And the way that we do that is through this very simple but very powerful process called self-reflection. Um, self-reflection has, again, got uh, quite a bit of attention in the media over the past, uh, I would say, couple of years. Um, prominent authors and, and speakers like Simon Sinek have uh, made YouTube videos that are, are very interesting, just talking a little bit about how self-reflection has improved their lives. But to try to close that gap between what we perceive of ourselves and, and the way the rest of the world perceives us, self-reflection is probably the single best tool for moving you in that direction. There's other elements that we do in our companies. We do 360 reviews where we have people you know, above us, below us, at our same level, evaluate us, and we get information from that. There's a lot of ways to do it. They're all decent. But this idea of personal self-reflection is a very, very powerful way of trying to move you forward every day. There's a great book that I don't mention. I a few books to go over later that are worth looking at. But there's uh, this one in particular that uh, I don't mention. It's called uh, The Slight Edge by a guy named Jeff Olson. And what he espouses in this book is that it's very rare that we, you know, you see somebody who wins the lottery in their in their life changes dramatically immediately. Uh, you don't get that one big project done and immediately get promoted to the next level. Life and and life and the decisions we make, uh, the almost inconsequential little decisions that we make, are basically going to be moving us either towards a better version of ourselves or away from being a better version of ourselves. And this concept of uh, the slight edge says that if you're trying to lose weight, then if you go out to lunch and you have a hamburger and a bunch of fries, you know, you're not going to get fat immediately. You're you're going to, you know, no one's going to notice it, you know. But if you have that same hamburger and fries every day for, you know, the next 10 years, the probability is very high that you're going to be putting on weight. If, on the other hand, you make a decision to have perhaps a, a salad then you're not going to get thinner the first couple of days that you have a salad. But if you do that progressively over a long time, all of a sudden you're going to have a leaner, trimmer you. And it's the same thing with all the leadership attributes that we'll be talking about. When you look at leadership and you say, well, I am not just going to read a book and, or attend a seminar and, and become a great leader. I'm going to have to take little, little steps, one decision at a time to try to move me there. And so the way I personally practice uh, self-reflection is I, I like to start off at the beginning of the day and, and think about, you know, what are the things I'm trying to do? And I, I happen to use a leadership checklist that I got off the web. It happens to be from Gary Waymiller, uh, amazing people-centered company. And it's out there on the web. You can download it if you want. I have it on my desk and I look at it and say, all right, well, these are the five things I want to try to focus on today. I'm going to have a meeting with so-and-so and I think I want to encourage them to you know, uh, in this, or I want to, you know, coach them on something, or this is what I'm going to do for recognizing somebody for something great they did. And so my, I start my day by sort of thinking about what do I want to try to get done? And then 
at the end of the day, you go back and you spend another few minutes and say, all right, well, these, these are the things I was hoping to do. How many of them did I actually get done? What did I actually do? And the whole point of it is not to beat yourself up for the things you didn't do, but realize that, hey, this is a continuum, and I just want to be a little bit better tomorrow than I am today. So I hope that makes some sense, and uh, we'll be talking a little more about reflection as we get into this. So what are the attributes of people-centric leaders? And uh, it sort of starts with this idea of caring, uh, building relationships. And the center of that, the key to that, and to many of these other elements, is going to start with active listening. And active listening is essentially understanding that uh, we're all born with the ability to hear, but listening is really a skill that as you focus on it, you can learn to become better at it. So active listening is a pretty big deal, and it uh, really helps to build relationships. It's this concept that when you're talking with someone and listening to someone, the spotlight goes entirely on them, and your entire goal of that meeting, of that, of that conversation, is to completely understand what they're trying to tell you through their body language, through the nonverbals, through the words that they speak. And trying to completely immerse yourself in that for the benefit of understanding, and then replying to them again based upon what you know that that you're that they're trying to tell you what they're trying to say to you. Another another key element of people centric leaders is this concept of humility. And we've all known leaders and seen leaders uh you know, either publicly or, or, or in our companies that are very arrogant. And they probably get a lot of things done, but if you really want to build a people-centric culture, then it really starts with you recognizing that you're human, you put your pants on the same way as the other person does, and being willing to sort of allow yourself to be put back into the shadows so that the focus can be on the others around you. And that is the enabler that encourages people to get involved and to engage. All relationships have at the core uh, of them a foundation of trust. And trust is a tricky thing because there's a, a tremendous difference between being trustworthy and being trusted. And too often we think of ourselves as being trustworthy, but we don't necessarily have the trust of the people that we're working with. And so, Focusing on trust and being willing to trust first, in other words, trust the people first, enables them to begin trusting you. and You can earn that trust and uh, hopefully keep it. The, uh, the third area, the fourth area here, is really around coaching and developing people. Uh, in the past, we haven't really thought of our role as managers or directors or leaders as being teachers. But if you look at companies again that are doing this really well, uh, Toyota comes to mind. You know, every Toyota manager, supervisor, leader is primarily a teacher and a coach. And they see that as, you know, a, a major number one responsibility that they have to do. So that's, that's a really important thing to start getting your head around. Uh, this idea of inspiration and vision, it certainly is something that at the highest levels we expect in our organizations, but even at the lower levels of the organization, uh, people want to know that what they're doing matters, and being conscious of that and tying it in uh, to what they're doing and giving them affirmation based upon that really goes a long way. And then this this last point, but far from least, recognition and celebration. Uh, with my own teams, uh, I recall the first time I made a decision to do more recognition at our staff meetings. And I put up a slide and I recognized somebody who had done something really good. And uh, I asked people to applaud and, and uh, encourage them to applaud. And we just did it. And I said, anybody want to recognize anybody else for doing something great? And it was like crickets. There was, <laughs> there was not a word being said. Everybody was very sort of weird and uncomfortable. And so the next week I did it again. I put up another slide with another person being recognized for something really great they did. And we applauded and 
And I did that for about a month. And uh, I was starting to think that uh, this was not going to take. And then something clicked. And I sort of had my first uh, first follower, I guess you'd call it. And somebody said, yeah, I, I want to recognize, uh, you know, Susie, because she, she just, she really, she came in Saturday and she did something for me. Didn't have to do it, but she just volunteered to come in. It really got me over the top on this thing. And uh, within about two months, it was a, a totally different dynamic in that meeting. And of course, what happens is that when people start celebrating the goodness in the people that they work with, uh, first, it makes it a lot harder to throw stones. And secondly, it gives them the opportunity to uh, you know, work much, much closer together when they leave the meeting room and go out and do their work. So I can't emphasize enough how important recognition and celebration is to creating a culture of trust and uh, engagement. So there's one other area. This is uh, a slide. And I've got to pick up my pace here, uh, but this is a slide from the AME's Executive Leadership Summit. This is a group of folks that got together. All of them were sort of CEO level, executive C-suite type people. And they came up with these five elements that they felt were really critical attributes of people-centric leaders. And we've spoken already about the first four, you know, trust in people, humility, active listening, being inspirational. And this last one is called Go to Gemba. And if you look at this, this is the concept of getting out of your office and actually going to where the work is happening. And uh, there are so many benefits to this. Again, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but it's so important to actually go there, uh, no matter what your level is within the organization, to observe what's going on, to talk to people, to start building relationships, to uh, communicate what's going on in the organization, to not solve problems, but to help people, enable people to solve problems. So going to the Gemba is a, another major attribute that we want to embrace as people-centric leaders. And then that same group said, you know, what would be the cultural environment that you would see if leaders behaved this way? And We'd see a lot of recognition and celebration. There'd be much greater transparency. There'd be a bias towards continuous improvement. Uh, people would stop being criticized for problems and start seeing problems as opportunities. And there's a, there would be a general recognition that all people are problem solvers. And the outcomes, uh, it may sound a little lofty, but they are very practical and true. That communities start to thrive. Customers are drawn you and your company for products and services, people start to believe they make a difference and that carries over into their lives. People feel enriched and uh, prospective employees uh, line up at your door to try to work for you. So these are the things that we actually see in companies that are getting it right. So how do we get started? Um, I think the first thing is, oh, sorry. I lost my slide. The first place to start is you know, making that decision to to really care and to want to start down this journey. Where you are in terms of the number of people that report for you, to you or the, the sort of the span of control for what your job is will change a little bit what you might want to do, where you might want to start. But at the end of the day, it all comes down to you making a personal decision that, hey, we're going to move forward in this direction, and I'm going to be part of the solution. So if you're a shift supervisor or a project leader with you know, a handful of people that you're uh, entrusted to lead, it starts with caring for them, developing relationships, uh, learning how to listen to them, starting to trust people, recognizing that your job is to teach and to coach. Uh, and then when they do great stuff, recognize and celebrate. Uh, and then all these will have that element of practice and reflection. So what can you do today or what can you do tomorrow? Um, you could begin starting to have daily stand-up meetings, you know, to develop visual boards, to start engaging your team on a daily basis to solve problems together, to recognize the, uh, the things that you need to get done and the things you've done great. Um, one of the things that works really well here is if you find some good books that you can take your team through to help educate them, that's another way to bring your team along and help them 
move in this direction. Uh, if your company doesn't have strong leadership guidelines, go to the internet and, and sort of develop what do you think the right standard for you personally is, and then use that as a measure mark for you to guide yourself uh, along the way. And then two areas that I, I really uh, strongly suggest. One is uh, consider two-second lean. This is something, there was a great webinar, I think it was just last week, that Mark Braun from uh, Cambridge Engineering led. Uh, I believe it's on the AME website. And uh, he talks about this whole process of two-second lean and how everybody every day is expected to make some little contribution, just little tiny incremental changes that overall add up to major, major shifts and encourage tremendous engagement. And then uh, kata coaching is another methodology that will help you with the coaching practice. So those are some things if you're a shift supervisor or project leader. If you're, you've got a larger group to, to work with, uh, again, most of, the, most of the activities and skills that develop are very similar. The, I think the importance of being a little more inspirational, casting vision comes here as well as uh, the importance of actually getting out of your office or conference room and getting to the Gemma. Um, the rest of them are, are very common to, I think, all levels of leadership. And then for, for this level of, of person, uh, you know, developing your leadership standards based upon what your company has, if it's available, or if it's not available, again, sort of reaching out and at least within your, your span of control, uh, say, here's how we're going to work, guys. Here's the things that are important to us. Maybe develop these ideas concurrently with your group and with your leaders. And then, uh, you know, if you do lean activities now, use those activities to help develop leadership skills. Uh, once again, consider kata coaching, introducing that to your team. Uh, definitely consider looking at two-second lean and, and that continuous improvement approach. And then uh, building people-centered behaviors into your performance plans. In developing yourself and your in your leadership team via workshops, book studies, and, and that kind of thing. Lastly, if you're on this call and you're involved uh, at a CEO or executive level, the ability to influence the organization becomes that much more significant. And so, the, the skills are very similar to what a, a director or a manager, senior manager, might do. But the actions uh, at this level would be really looking forward at how do you build this into your three to five year plans? How do you start growing yourself? What kind of alignments can you make with, with key organizations? Uh, you know, AME or Barry Waymiller's Leadership Institute. There's some great organizations out there that are doing some fabulous stuff and there'd be great partners to work with to try to develop this uh, within your company. And then, uh, and also opportunities as well uh, through the AME if you if you're interested to uh, involve yourself with other C-suite leaders who are on the same journey. Uh, recognition, performance systems, all of those good things are things that you can start tackling and moving forward. So I, I sort of summarize things here with uh, a few quotes that I think are worth worth thinking about. Uh, this one's by Paul Akers. He's the the gentleman who really runs a company called FastCap and uh, the author of Two Second Lean. Leaders innately believe that people are smart and capable. Managers tend to think of, or managers think that people are not very smart and that they are smarter. Leaders believe all people have potential and can be developed and bloom. I think that's a powerful quote. And then here's one from Bob Chapman, who uh, you could probably uh, read a thousand of these in his book. But the person you report to has more to do with your health than the family doctor. And just a reminder of the profound importance it is for the immediate supervisor to uh, has to the people that they are privileged to lead. So with that, uh, I just want to open up to any questions you might have. Uh, I think we still got a few minutes, have a few minutes left. Yes. Great, thanks, Alan. And now we'll review any questions. So if you do have any questions, please type them in on the right side of your screen and I'll be able to read them off. And here's one. How do you handle people who just don't want to change? That's that's a really, that's a great question. Um, I think that the right thing to do is to focus on the people who are getting it. Uh, there's always going to be naysayers and people who 
don't want to change. I, I recall, I, I think it was three or four years ago, I was actually, I was talking with Bob Chapman, and uh, I think I asked him the exact same question, and he, and he basically looked at me and said, well, we, we don't do anything with them. We just <laughs> we sort of leave them where they are, and we focus on, on the 98% that get it and want to dro- develop and grow themselves. And the people who don't get it are either going to become uncomfortable with the new culture of the company and, and decide themselves that it's not a good fit and leave, or eventually they get on board with the program. So I think the short answer is just sort of allow them to self-direct in when when they're ready and if they're ready and work with the people who are deciding to uh, opt in and get on board with the direction. Okay, great. Our next question is, what do you do if the company hasn't made a corporate decision to pursue a people-centric culture? I think uh, I'll, I'll reflect on it on one more sort of Bob Chapman story. And uh, I had a group of uh, executives from, from Siemens uh, with Bob in uh, at one of the AME conferences, actually. And uh, he, he gave us the privilege of talking to us for about an hour and a half. And at the end of that session, you know, everybody was really very moved. You could see it just visibly on every face. And one of the, one of the guys at the table was a, a VP sent to Bob, he says, well, what do you do if, if, if corporate doesn't want to do this? And uh, if, if you don't get get permission from corporate to do this. And I recall Bob looking at him and saying, well, he says, he says I'm not sure about you, but I'm, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, wait for Monday morning to come and wait for a letter from corporate to say it's okay to be to be good to people, to recognize people, to celebrate people. And it was just sort of a funny way of recognizing that no matter where you are, you can make a difference in your own team. And, and to the extent that you are able to do that, you're going to see the performance benefits. You're going to see your team rise to a different, higher level. So it's harder, and, I, and I'll be very open with you, it's, it's much harder when you don't have a corporate culture supporting this initiative. But it's it's absolutely very practical and very appropriate to, to start wherever you are. You might be a supervisor with two or three people. Start listening to them. Start making a conscious decision to try to help them develop and become better versions of themselves, and people respond. I, I could tell you a number of stories, but I, I don't think we have enough time, and uh, maybe we could share them some other time, some other way. Okay. Uh, another question is, what kind of training would you recommend, and how would you approach it? Yeah, another good, another really good question, uh, Jerry. Uh, so the, I think that learning how to listen is probably the most core investment that you can make. So the uh, AME and Barry Way Miller both offer a course. Uh, it actually came from Barry Way Miller, but it's called Listen Like a Leader. Uh, very powerful three-day workshop. Uh, that's a tremendous way to start. I think the other offering that uh, Amy has is, uh, from a training perspective, is PCL 101. And I know there's a couple of offerings that are being set up over the next few months. I think I've got a, a slide with some of those I can put up for you. But the other the other thing uh, I was going to suggest is uh, there's a lot of great books. I've listed some some of these here in the presentation. Uh, Everybody Matters is uh, um, Rush the Soda in Bob Chapman's book. It's it's like a classic. But uh, Leaders Eat Last by Simon Sinek is tremendous. There's a book called People. It's sort of off the beaten path, but it's a great book that uh, basically helps you understand the role of a lean leader in the organization. Two Second Lean by Paul Akers. These are all really good places to start. And if you go to the AME webpage, um, you'll see uh, there's, there's a link to it. But uh, Amy has a whole list of resources that you can look to to try to learn more about this stuff. I think the key thing I would say in terms of developing your, yourself and your organization is allow people to self-direct in. Um, I know I'm sort of a, a disc model, I'm sort of a D, and I like to say, let's go, guys, we're just all going to, we're all in. And we set up this training that tends to be mandatory, and you know, always people sitting there saying that uh, I'd rather be anywhere but here. And so, I've learned this the hard way that uh, it's much, much more powerful to allow people to self-direct when they're ready to move in the direction. It's a lot harder 
in, in the sense that if you're trying to move the organization, you get a few people who just don't want to play. Um, it puts, it, it makes for many opportunities to coach and to work your way through it, uh, which probably strengthens you. But it allow people to self-direct into this. At the end of the day, you want the organization to self-direct into engagement, and you can't mandate that. <laughs> Wish we could. Okay, great. Well, thank you everyone for your questions and thank you, Alan, for a very insightful presentation. We'll be sending a recorded link for webinar replay to each of you next week. This brings our webinar to a close. Our next scheduled webinar will be on Thursday, March 1st, titled Turn Unpredictability into Opportunity with Mixed Model Flow with Kevin Dugan. Please visit amy.org under the AME Events and Training tab for more information and to register. Please don't forget to fill out the short survey that will be in your inbox. Thank you everyone for attending and have a productive day.